what is the thing that you you think people are really uh, misunderstanding about the police? That we want to lock everybody up. You know, that we want to take everybody to jail. Uh, what motivates me the most is is really what I call my three Fs, faith, family, and friends. They motivate me to be better uh, because they care about me. They love me. When I was in high school, there was an expectation you were going to go to college. It was something that was necessary if you wanted to get into business or get into a more white collar type of job. I don't think that's necessarily the case today. Mm -hmm. Make mistakes for the sake of learning. Mm -hmm. I love the quote from Nelson Mandela, you know, the former president of South Africa, mm -hmm. who said, I never lose. I either learn or I win. All right, so today we have Terry and uh, Oh, Terry has a huge, unique story, and today he's going to just, uh, you know, talk to us about it. But first, I would like to ask Terry, uh, what motivates you the most, pretty much? Well, first of all, Clovis, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this with you today. Uh, what motivates me the most is, is really what I call my three Fs, faith, family, and friends. They are the most important things in my life in that order, my faith in God, the family that I have, and the friends that I have. They motivate me to be better uh, because they care about me. They love me. And I think I learned that very early on in my life. My parents taught my brothers and I that, you know, the importance of family, to love each other, to care for each other, to support each other along the journey. And I don't think my brothers and I have have really forgotten that. We're still very close. We still talk all the time on the phone, even though we don't live in the same cities and things like that. So I would say my faith, family, and friends is really what motivates me. Faith, family, and friends. Like in that order? Or you have a... Uh, no, in that order. Absolutely. God is number one, then my family, and then my friends. Wow, that, that is great. And you say that you inherit that from uh, parents, right? So like uh, uh, the... Are your parents still alive today? My mom is. My dad died shortly after I graduated from college. So he's been dead for almost 40 years now. But yeah, they, you know, I, I don't have any sisters. My brothers and I were all athletes. We all played uh, college athletics. One of my brothers played professionally, uh, professional basketball. But we were all going in a million different directions. Our whole family revolved around sports. And it was if you didn't have a game or a practice and your brother did, then you were going to that game to support your brother and things like that. So we were we, we got very close because our parents, I think, emulated that that's what was important in life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's really great. And I, I can see that a, a little of a, like, a, you know, competitiveness where you are, uh, you have brothers going around and also, yeah, going into sports. That's some early on. Uh, you know, physical practice that can help be pretty much like uh, stay in shape and also, uh, you know, stay away from from any other trouble that can be maybe in the neighborhood or any other places. And also uh, just help you uh, be healthy because everybody who does sports is pretty much healthy in the first place uh, because you, you don't just like take anything. Uh, and also you, you are disciplined. And yeah, that's some great parenting and some some great things really to grow up on. You know, it's really important to hear that. So talking about the uh, how you grew up. So you grew up with your both mom and dad alive in, in one, uh, like not a single parenthood, just like, a, you know, a regular uh, married couple having children. And uh, you mentioned that having your like the way your parents uh, treated you, how you were young, and also with your brothers, it helped you to really like uh, uh, pursue so many things in life. What is the first thing that you did when you become an adult? Uh, something like, uh, you know, what adult do uh, in a professional way? That, that's, that's a great question. I mean, you know, I, I mean, our parents always encouraged us to do things that were interesting to us. And, mm -hmm. and like I said, it was sports for us. I mean, but my parents also required an hour of reading every day. They also required us to maintain a minimum of a C average in school. So academics was also incredibly important. If, if you fell below a C average, my parents didn't care how good you were. You weren't gonna play sports until you, you, know, you, you got your grades up. 
And so grades um, were important and things like that. And mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, one of the other things my parents taught us is, is to be well-rounded, you know, is to pursue things that, that you are interested in, things that you enjoy, things that you like to do and things like that. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed writing. I, I was in the honors English program when I was in high school wow. and things like that. Mm -hmm. But my first love, to be honest with you, was to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. My grandfather had been a Chicago police officer from 1924 to 1954 and was actually shot in the line of duty with his own gun. It was not a serious injury. He was shot in the ankle. But when I expressed an interest in pursuing what my grandfather did, my father was absolutely not. You're going to college, you're gonna major in business, you're gonna get out, get a great job, get married, have 2.4 kids and live happily ever after. <laughs> that's what my dad wanted me to do. That's not what I felt I was supposed to do. Wow, 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 that's, wow, that's really, that's really great. So you, uh, your grandfather's full step is what you, you ended up like pursuing pretty much. So uh, it, it kind of reminds me of the part that oh, we're discussing pretty much with people is like, oh, you know, uh, what, what you want for your children, sometimes it's not what makes them responsible and it's not that what, what shapes their adulthood. And yeah, that, that kind of reminds me. Of stuff. So, uh, but in your case, everything was, was really good. You got, from your, you got those uh, early uh, ages reading and uh, that got you into, uh, you know, writing and also, you know, just reading and learning because reading and learning should not be separate like they shouldn't be separated uh, as you, you you read more you learn more pretty much so and also you you you, you went on and uh and got into uh, like a duty and you started uh you, you you started pretty much serving that way and what really uh what is really that something that you saw in your pa uh, grandparent that made you really uh, decide to pursue that you know, I think when I was young, it was the excitement. It was the adventure, you know, of being a police officer. I I, mm -hmm. I wish I could sit here and tell you it was the, the altruistic, you know, that I wanted to make a difference and all that kind of stuff. I think initially when I was younger, it was really the excitement of the job. But then as I got older, I think it was really how can I make a difference? How can I help my, my community where I am living mm -hmm. to be safer and things like that? And I, unfortunately, I really didn't know my grandfather. He died when I was six years old, but my grandmother lived all the way up until I was in college. So I mm -hmm. learned about him through her and through the stories that she told. And my my aunt or her sister-in-law, my grandfather's brother, was also a police officer. So I had people around me that kind of told me, told me the stories and things like that. And, and law enforcement policing was much, much different back in the 1920s and 30s and 40s and things like that than it is than it is today. It's there, there's more science behind it today and things like that. Back then, it was the respect that the badge and, and the position commanded. And you could really make a difference in a kid's life or a, a family's life and stuff like that as a police officer back then. I don't think you can have as much of an impact today. You still can have an impact. And that was what really attracted me to the job. Oh, wow, that's really great. And yeah, and also, what is because you know uh, people pretty much have a, a lot of disconnect with uh, with the police and uh, how they work and everything. Uh, pretty much anything w which involves like the governments. And also, what is the thing that uh, I'm not saying like changing people's minds or anything. What is the thing that you you think people are uh, really uh, misunderstanding about the police. That we want to lock everybody up, you know, that <laughs> we want to take everybody to jail. We, we really don't. I mean, that's a lot of time. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of things that we really don't want to do. And I, yeah. you know, we, we want to make a difference. We want to solve problems, but the problem is we're called in to solve issues that a lot of times have been festering for sometimes decades, you know, 10, mm -hmm. 20, 30 years, and you have to show up and in 15 or 20 minutes, try to solve the problem, or at least try to keep the problem at bay for the rest of your shift. And so I, I, the other thing that I, I, that I always tried to remember was, 
if I pulled somebody over for, you know, speeding or running a stop sign or some something like that, for them, it may have been the scariest thing that happened to them all year. Mm-hmm. For me, it was the third traffic stop of the night. And so it was something I did as a routine part of my job for, for somebody in the general public. It was incredibly scary. And that, so I think one of the last things I'll say about this is if you want to be good as a police officer, you have to be able to talk to people. Because if you can talk to people, you can understand where they're coming from. That we call that empathy. And, you know, maybe not agree with you, but help me to understand. Because if I can understand you, then you feel, or I hope you feel, that you can trust me. I understand where you're coming from. I'm not, I'm not just coming in here and putting handcuffs on you and you're going to jail. No, help me understand why we're here so hopefully we can make a difference so that we don't have to keep coming back, you know, two or three times during a shift and just kind of pushing the problem down the road. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly uh, what I, I thought too. Because uh, most of the time, you know, uh, it's also... Uh, due to the fact that there's a pretty much like a lack of communication among the people from the government and the people they represent, and also uh, also with the police, it's it, it's kind of like a, a flip side on the, on the, in the fact that you went there being inspired with the good work and good examples that you saw from your grandpa or any other police uh, officer that you were looking up to. And you get uh, most people go to those kind of things. Like you go to the police, you go to the army uh, with uh, with hate. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? It's like they go there because they were abused or maybe there's something bad happened to them. And then now they go there, it's like a payback. And it's kind of uh, that thing also is also something that maybe police, if anybody is, is watching this, maybe they can be able to see if how they can really uh, if somebody is coming with hate, maybe they go through a process where they can really heal from that, then they can really serve. Because I'm not sure, see, if somebody can serve uh, with hate, serving always come with love, serving always come with empathy, as you mentioned, and uh, serving always come with uh, the need to help and not just not the other way around. So, yeah, thank you so much for uh, the time that you had. Right now, you, you said you are. Uh, are you still the pull? Are you still in the police, or you you left already? No, I, I I left a number of years ago, and and just let me echo that that you're absolutely right. And and there were police officers that I worked with that should not have been police officers. They were not good at it. They they didn't have, as you say, you know, the empathy or the service uh, modality. And those usually we would weed them out. It was like, no, that that person shouldn't be here anymore. But like mm-hmm. any other job, you know, you have you have good police officers and bad police officers. You have good yeah. teachers and bad teachers. You know, you have good business people and bad business people. We're human. And, you know, yeah. sometimes people slip through the cracks. But you're you're absolutely right. I mean, you've got to have the right temperament and you've got to have the right motivation to want to do that job. Yeah, that, that is actually true, because uh, the thing is, at the end of the day is uh, when people People, we need to believe in a transformation of people and uh, everybody has to be able to go through that, it's especially where we cannot really uh, put like a default state where it's like everybody is not perfect. So and however, we have to be willing to change in order to go in certain certain position or do certain certain things. And yeah, that's really great. So thank you again for your service. And uh, I'm sure the uh, people. Uh, you, you serve well, and also people get to uh, experience uh, your service and also appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, so what? how do you do the transition? Because I know people from the military, uh, whenever they want to transition, sometimes they go through uh, things that are, uh, you know, army related or just, you know, going with the military or maybe too bureaucratic and stuff. And how did you transition? Did you pursue in the you know, office places in the police or research or anything, or where where did you want it to go after the police? So I ended up leaving law enforcement because my wife had always been the primary breadwinner in our family, and she ended up losing her job. And we ended up moving to Houston, Texas. 
So I had to get out of law enforcement, but I had a college degree. I had a master's degree. I spent a few years in law school and I had all this law enforcement training. I was on the SWAT team and things like that. And so I started a school security consulting business and I worked with schools around the United States to assess their physical security, to write their policies and procedures and to train their staff on those policies and procedures. So for me, it was, I, I, I never felt that my identity was a police officer. You know, it wasn't like, well, this is the only thing I can do in my life. No, I can find other things to do that will be fun, that will be rewarding for me. And so I started this school security consulting business. And I also coached girls high school basketball at the same time. So having my own, my own job, being my own boss, allowed me to, to also coach basketball, which I, which I love to do as well. Wow. Yeah. Because as, as the start in sports and now, now you can just branch out and everything. So like, right. do you, uh, do you support the fact that, uh, starting early also helps to really, uh, think, uh, long-term and also, uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention, but just like, uh, in a few seconds was just, uh, you say you had, uh, uh your degree that helped you to uh, pretty much change the career faster. And I've seen uh, so many people online uh, these days, he says like, oh, you don't need to go to college. You, you don't need to, to do uh, uh, like a, to study because it's easy to, to do things nowadays and everything. And uh, I, I don't say I fully agree with that. Although like the educational system is, uh, is like pretty much not, not changing much. But I, I think uh, when people are, will stop putting the blame on the schools and, and also seeing themselves as people who can start the early teaching as parents, as you say, like you got that early readings and everything. I think that can also help because, you know, nowadays parents, they just have children. They put them to school. It's like a way of uh, getting away of them. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, okay, you go away uh, for certain hours. And then when you come back, we just come to drop you and pick you up certain hours and then when they, they go home there's little to no uh follow-up or education the parents don't even know what these the, the children are studying or what subjects they are really doing so i think uh the part that blaming the educational system can be uh you know not really supported too much because uh people also forget sometimes their responsibilities and everything. So what can you say? Just, just a segment about that is because at the end of the day, somebody who has a degree in pretty much all jobs and everybody who want to uh, like pretty much, because the easiest way to make money, uh, as I always tell people is not to like, you start a business, you need to spend more money to, <laughs> to, to start pretty much. And you need funding. You need a lot of stuff. Although like you can, People say you can start with zero, but you have internet that you need to pay for, <laughs> cable right. and all the stuff. So it's not really zero, zero, zero. So the easiest way is your knowledge that you get from school. Like your degree can help you have a job that they're going to pay you. You're going to learn the job. Then you can take that and start a business. So what can you say to the part that people are, are putting the, like, uh, casting shades on the, uh, or like, there's, there's no need for you to go to college. There's no need for you to, to go to school because it's easy nowadays to make a living. And do you really also support that? I would like to hear your version of that and also uh, how you also see that in, in terms of uh, parents' responsibility in their children's education. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. I, I, see I see a, a lot, lot of parents that sort of, you know, they, they're, they're box checkers, so to speak. You know, they, they, they get a degree, check the box. They get married, check the box. They have a kid or two kids or whatever, check the box. And kids are just a, a, a box that they check, that, that they've done. But being a parent means you're involved. You've, you've got to know what's going on in your kid's life, who their friends are, who they're hanging out with, what they're learning in school, where they're having difficulties in life and things like that. That's your job. That's that's what you're supposed to do as a parent. It's not just have a kid. You know, I mean, I, it's something I did. Yeah, no, I've always tell, especially younger people, they are like, you know, do you have any advice? I'm like, yeah, remember, you're the parent. You're not mm -hmm. their friend. You're going to mm -hmm. have to make the tough calls. You're going to have to mm -hmm. make the hard decisions that say, no, I'm sorry, you're not going to that party because the person's mom and dad aren't going to be there. There's not going to be mm -hmm. 
any responsible adult, adult there. And what happens? You know, the kid goes stomping up the stairs and slams the door and says they hate you and all that kind of stuff. And I get that. But then you say, I, I understand where you're coming from, but I'm doing this because I love you. If I didn't mm -hmm. love you, I'd let you do whatever you wanted. So yeah. kids need boundaries. The other part of that, and, and I agree with you to a point, when I was in high school, there was an expectation you were going to go to college. It was something mm -hmm. that was necessary if you wanted to get into business or get into a more white collar type of job. I don't think that's necessarily the case today. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are certain things where college is absolutely necessary. I mean, yeah. if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a lawyer, if you oh. want to be something like that. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage people that find out what you're good at. Find out what mm -hmm. you like. Find out what you enjoy and then pursue that. Maybe you're good with engines and you like, you know, tinkering with cars or trucks or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go to college for that. You could go yeah. to trade school. You know, you can go in the military and learn a trade or something that you want to do. And so there's a lot of different avenues other than going to college and getting so in debt. I mean, mm -hmm. my my goddaughter is one hundred nine thousand dollars in debt wow. with an elementary school education degree. She teaches like fifth grade. Oh, and, man. and she, I mean, she'll be paying that off for the rest of her life. That was not a good move. That was not something mm -hmm. that she she needed to spend that kind of money on to get that degree. So I think you need to be smart about that and try to mm -hmm. find people in your life, whether it's your parents, whether it's teachers at school, when you're in high school, whether it's your counselors at school or whatever, that will help you make the right decision for what you want to do with your life. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for your take. And also, yeah, that. That is really, really, really right. So people should look for stuff that, like most things don't need a degree, which is also, and also the transition of the educational system. Nowadays, people study online, people take mentorship, people take uh, so many things that they can do. You can consult with people. I think it's more of a putting in place these youth programs and other stuff that can really help uh, the children also to to know their path, where they're going. Because nowadays you ask somebody who's studying college, you say, what are you going to do in life? They don't know. Even before they start college, they don't know what major they're going to have to apply for. And it's it's funny. And yeah, for me, college was really compulsory because I had to do it because I did engineering. And uh, uh, engineering, uh, it, college was required. And it's a great career. It's a great path because I, I love technology and uh, I love to to create a lot of stuff, you know, website, apps, automations, and other stuff. So I had to study that. But nowadays, it's like, can somebody study that? I don't think they can if they don't have money because most people are willingly going into debt, as you mentioned. It's like, uh, and they don't even know how they're going to pay up because after that, more debts are going to pile up and it's going to be hard for you to even pay the first ones. And so if there's any way you can do a mentorship or you can take like a, a six month or one year program instead of doing the full uh thing uh, that can help also to to pursue that but, but the, the first thing as you mentioned is to know what you you want to do in life it's like w knowing what you want to do in life and if you did not get that uh that that, that first one then the rest is gonna be a disaster so yes that's so great so you got. Uh, Can I follow up on that real quick? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, I mean, you're right. And I'll be honest with you. You know, I mean, when you get out of high school, when you're 17 or 18 years old, you may not know what you want to do with your life. And, and that's OK. Don't mm. don't I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say, you know, try something because, you know, you, like I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I was in that boat. I mean, I majored in business because my father told me to major in business. I didn't know what I wanted to major in, but I, I heard somebody talk about how maybe we can view our lives so that one, we can be more successful and two, we can take some of the pressure off of us. You know, we, we tend to look at our lives sort of in, you know, in, in six months or in, in 12 month increments. And this person said we should look at our lives in decades. 
So he mm-hmm. said, in your 20s, he said, dig into everything, do all kinds of things, whether you like them or not, try things, make mistakes, you know, blunder, get into stuff. And then in your 30s, find those maybe two or three things that you really enjoy and dig into them. Mm-hmm. And then in your 40s, find that one thing that's kind of in your heart or your soul and get into that. And then in your 50s and 60s, you can harvest based on that information. And, you know, you see so many people that are like, well, I'm 32 years old. I don't have the job that I want. I'm not making the money I want. I don't have the family that I thought I would have. And that's putting pressure on yourself that you don't need. It's okay to be 32 years old and not have the right job yet. It will come if you keep doing things that you enjoy based on your unique gifts and talents. And we all have different gifts and talents. So, you know, I probably wouldn't be good at engineering. You might not be good at writing, but that's that's what makes us good together because yeah. you've got a skill and I've got a skill and that that just makes us different. And I can learn from you. You can learn from me. Yeah, that exactly. Exactly. Like, yeah, different. Diff- and also, yeah, as you mentioned, so most people sometimes they forget to think of that because it, it goes to the point that what people are always saying is like uh, with most people, the uh, over. They overestimate what they can do in one year and they underestimate what they can do in 10 years. And sometimes it's like this is New Year's resolution. You get you get well every 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 year, like New Year's resolution. I'm gonna do this next year. Uh I'm gonna do this. It's like every year you say I'm gonna do this, and you, you end up not doing it. It's like every time yep. it's just the cycle that is never ending. And it's really it's really sad when it's like. And then they put up a, like a list of 10, 10 things. And then even the first one is never done. <laughs> it's, it's always, yeah. So thank you. And also, yeah, they have to really to, to think, uh, you know, ahead of the time. They have to think uh, deeper. And then I say is the parents have to really take up to that and also, yeah, teach their children. Because I understand most people did not get the luxury of doing this, uh, of like, uh, having that, they did not get that from their parents. But it doesn't mean that they have to pass down the same thing they got. So they have to self-actualize and make sure that they are passing down the right information. So yeah, that's really something to uh, for every parent and everybody just to look up to and, and just uh, you know uh, take uh, and, and apply into their lives. And so your transition went into uh, being a security uh, consultant for high school. And also, uh, you 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 start becoming like your own boss once you get a job, and also you have that one where you started uh, doing like becoming your own boss and feeling that you can really uh, lead yourself. So, did you have any uh, like kind of uh, what 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 were your setbacks in that particular thing? Like during your your transition, uh, where were your setbacks, and how did you overcome them? Yeah, I, I had no idea how to start a business. And I I was like, okay, what, what do I do here? And I ended up going to our daughter's school and a couple other schools and saying, look, for free, I will do a security assessment for you. I will write your policies and procedures. I will train your staff. And so there was a, you know, I had to gain credibility. I had to gain mm-hmm does this person know what they're talking about kind of situation? And so the schools agreed. I mean, I was giving it to them for nothing and they liked what I did. And so then it was a matter of growing my business pretty much word of mouth where somebody would say, you know, to talk to another principal of a school and say, hey, Terry Tucker can do this for you if that's what you're looking for and things like that. So things grew very slowly. And, you know, there was sort of that frustration of, well, should I spend money that I don't have to market this service or should I just let this be word of mouth? And I I came to the conclusion it should be word of mouth because just like I started out, people didn't know who I was. You know, if I was going to do a consulting job for a school in New Jersey, they didn't know who I was, you know, so could I let the work that I've done 
speak for itself and then let other people, uh, you know, kind of get me going. And so I relied on, on some several people to help me get that business off the ground. It took it took quite a while. And then there were the the issues of I'll give you an example. There was a, a, a brand new school. It was a private school. Uh, it was a bunch of people from the East Coast that had moved to sort of the San Diego area in California and were starting this new school. And they contracted with me to do their safety and security. And so I, I was getting ready to go out and do my assessment of the school. And I get a call and they're like, well, our attorneys want to be able to determine what you're going to say in your assessment. And I said, no. I said, I'm not going to have some attorney who doesn't know what I know tell me what to put into a document where if I don't put in everything, potentially you can come back and sue me because you didn't know about this particular security issue. I said, so no, that, that's a deal breaker for me. You decide what you want to do. I'll walk away from this. And that took, you know, I, I, like I said, I was trying to grow a business. I mean, to walk away from a really good opportunity, yeah. but I knew what I was worth and I knew what was important. And they ended up saying, fine, just you do what you need to do from your perspective. And we're not going to let the attorneys tell you what to put in it. So it ended up working out for me. But I but I had to take a stand, uh, you know, against the school that I'd already had. A, I had a written contract with them. I probably mm -hmm. could have sued them. But that's, you know, I didn't really want to do that. I didn't want to be that guy, you know, that, well, you broke your contract. I probably would have just walked away from it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess it, it, it pretty much uh, resonates with uh, every early beginnings of every entrepreneur when they start out. So it's like uh, that credibility stop is like, okay, how do I get this? And and so many people, I'm, I'm glad you find your way uh, and also your way to uh, to get around things because for most people, they don't. It's like they try this for two days. They try this for two days. Like, okay, uh, let me do some some content let me do this let me do this and it's like you just decided it's like okay i'm just gonna go word of mouth and i'm gonna master that and i'm gonna go with that and it's a it's a kind of a focus that i always encourage people to have because uh, most people they don't have that focus they're just gonna do 10 things and then not even mastering one of those and it's laser focus is always good because everything works like everything works very well. And and also you just need to know which one of those are you going to focus on. And I'm sure you really did well on focusing on a word of mouth and also the early beginning where you can uh, uh, give, uh, you can let your work speak for itself. And most people nowadays, it's really hard because some people, they just, especially when you are uh, like you hiring, I don't know if you, you get to a point where you, you had to hire people, uh, but I have, and it's, it was a disaster to to most people because the good thing is like we kind of have a lot of people applying but for most people it's like whenever they give out like a portfolio or anything it's like pretty much something that they took from the internet and it's hard because you're gonna see that duplicated in like a different applications and you say like did you guys all work for the same person or <laughs> <laughs> Was it like was it were you guys on your, on the same team <laughs> or it's like I don't know who who who's the real like the original uh person for this work and it's really hard for that and for some people they might even decline the job because they are asked to do an assessment or some kind of stuff like where you have to do uh a certain stuff so that we can see really your work because you you've shown like different stuff from the internet and we don't know if you you're the one who did them so and some people will decline just for that and I, i'm sure for you it was good because you you really trust yourself to do that and you know like whatever challenge they're gonna you know throw at you you're just gonna ask them up because you know that you can do that and they're gonna see the work that you do and then they're gonna continue to to uh offer you more work. And I think most entrepreneurs should learn from that because uh, especially the starters, the ones who are starting in the early beginnings of entrepreneurship, you have no credibility. Nobody knows who you are. And you, you just want to get, you know, 
get started. And that's uh, pretty much uh, some of the ways to do it. And some people call like uh, free trials. Some people call paid trials. Some people call it like there's so many names that people, you know, some labels that people put on those. But it's just a way to, uh, uh, you know, you, some people can even call them like samples. So it's just a way to show that you are, you're having. But for me, the way I call them, uh, is like beta, beta clients. So it's like you're having beta clients, like the testers. You know, when uh, in technology, when the app is launched or any uh, tech product is launched, you have like a beta testers who mm-hmm. can start like running the apps and troubleshoot and see if there's something wrong or if uh, when clicking on a button, something doesn't pop up, we're supposed to pop out and pretty much everything like that. So uh, that's also another way for, for them before the, the, the they pretty much map out their go-to market strategy. So it's it's really a great great way. And, and I think if any entrepreneur who's studying can uh, can get this right, it might be uh, a really pretty much uh, a stepping stone for for more success in the future. So, and, and I'm sure your business took off. And could you t- talk to us about like uh, how the uh, how w- were you able to hire people? How did you handle uh, all the things and how when the business started? take off yeah I, I was a one-man show you know and so I I was you know constantly you know okay I've got to go do a site visit with this place but I've got this assessment that I've got to type up I didn't have I didn't have anybody to type for me I didn't have anybody to answer the phones I was doing it all and and that was fine because I really enjoyed the work and I mm-hmm. I really I, I liked doing this I like putting the finished product together and things like that so I I never I never got big enough to hire everybody uh, to hire anybody. And I, you know, I, I wouldn't at this point, I wouldn't really know how to go about doing that. You know, mm-hmm. where was I going to find people that had the experience that I had and that had the passion that I had and stuff like that? I, it would have been, you know, kind of like you said, I'm, I'll, I'll give you a trial and we'll see if this works out. Mm-hmm. But, but I, didn't, I didn't know anybody that it was like, well, if I can grow this more, I can bring this person in or that person in. I didn't really know anybody that wanted to do it in that. So I loved the work. I enjoyed it. It was fun. I, I really, I, I mean, some of the things that I saw in terms of security with schools that was like, uh, really? I mean, you know, there's a lock on the door for a reason. Just lock the door. You know, I mean, just simple things that, you know, that, that people can do that, you know, doesn't seem like it's rocket science. And yeah. You know, and but it was it was good because I got to work with local law enforcement, you know, and having been a police officer that that helped me as well. And that mm. so it was I never got big enough where I needed to add staff. Oh, wow, wow, wow. That's great. I, I think. Yeah, I think nowadays, if you could do the same thing, I think you can be able to add uh, staff and people, especially since it's becoming easier to even hire people from a post on social media. <laughs> and yeah. it's really like that. Uh, Wow, that's really great. And uh, how did you, uh, like after that, what did you do after? Mm. After that, I ended up getting cancer. And so I, I, oh. haven't, I haven't worked since then because of my cancer experience. I see, I see. So, and uh, you, still, you still have cancer up to now? I do. I, I have tumors in my lungs that I'm treated for every three weeks. I had my foot amputated in 2018, my leg amputated in 2020. So, yeah, it's it's been a 12 year battle with this disease. Wow! And and uh, throughout the time, like, how do you how do you stay motivated? Like, how do you stay like you know hyped, motivated, waking up every day, and uh, uh, pretty much do because you, I I know you still uh, you still do a lot of stuff, a lot of things that you still do. And you're still creating, you're still working, you're still serving. Is how do you have the uh, pretty much the motivation to keep doing what you have to do, this uh, in spite of all the stuff that has ha- happened? Yeah, that's a great question, and and I think it goes back to something I learned as being part of team sports. You know, I started mm-hmm. playing basketball when I was nine, and played all the way up until I graduated from college when I was 21, and. I think one of the things, one of the big things that team sports taught me was the importance of being part of something that's bigger than yourself. You know, you realize on a team that if you don't do your job, not only do you let yourself down, but you let your teammates down, your coaches down, your fans Mm -hmm. down, et cetera. 
And if you think about it, the biggest team game that we all play is this game of life. And sure. that's so when I got sick, I had to figure out different ways to do things. You know, I'd been a physical person my whole life. I was a college athlete. I was a police officer. I was on the SWAT team. I, I'd done all this stuff. And now I'm in a wheelchair and I don't have a left leg. So how do you balance that? Mm. And I think when you can't do what you're good at, you do what's important in life. And so I, I do a lot of podcasts. I mean, coming on podcasts with nice people like you that, that allow me to talk about my story, it gives me energy. It, it gives me a purpose. It gives me something to look forward to this, you know, besides having to go to the hospital and get treated and, and have the things done that I, that I do. And that's so that I've, I've written a book. I'm working on another book. I, I write a blog every Monday and Tuesday. I, I mean, I just, do things that give me energy that allow me to keep moving forward. Oh, well, I love the fact that you highlighted like uh, doing the things that are important and really uh, the importance of things. How do you find the importance of things? How do you know what is important and what's not? So I guess I'll tell you a story. And, and I've, I've seen so many people in my life, and my guess is you have seen these people as well, that feel that they are born empty mm. and that when they get out of school and they get into life, whatever that looks like for them, that then their job is somehow to fill up their empty self. You know, they got to get the best job and make the most money and drive the nicest car and have all the latest you know, gadgets and gizmos. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But what I found is it's just the opposite. We're not born empty. We're born full. We're born with everything we need to be successful. However you decide you want to define that word, already inside of us. We just need to pull it out and use it for our benefit. So our job in life, as far as I'm concerned, should not be to fill ourselves up. Our job in life should be to empty ourselves out with our unique gifts and talents, certainly for the betterment of ourselves, but also for the betterment of our families, of our friends, of our communities, of our country, et cetera. And when you make that switch to realizing it's about service, it's about giving, it's about making other people's lives better, all of a sudden you find out what's really important in life. Wow, that's, that's really a great illustration to do that. It's like, you don't, uh, I, I, I like to say, the way I say is like, uh, uh, with most people, it's like you have to uh, to know that when you are born, you are full, and when you you die, you have to die empty. So born full, yep. die empty. And yep. you say like you have to instead of filling ourselves up, we have to empty ourselves, and that's really so deep, and it's really so amazing. We can't even talk about it for hours, but it's really like wow, so amazing. And that that is the the motivation that fuels you to pretty much do what you do every single day. And what's the first book about and the title of the book? So the first book is called Sustainable Excellence, The Ten Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. And it was a book that was really born out of two conversations I had because I never I never expected to write a book. I never wanted to write a book. <laughs> Same. But, yeah. The first oh, conversation no. was with a former player that I had coached mm. in high school had moved to the area in Colorado with her fiance where my wife and I live. And mm -hmm. the four of us had had dinner. And after dinner, I remember saying to her that I was excited that she was living close and I could watch her find and live her purpose. And Chloe, she got real quiet for a while. And then she looked at me and she said, well, coach, what do you think my purpose is? I said, I have absolutely no idea what your purpose is. But that's what your life should be about, finding the reason you were put on the face of this earth, using your unique gifts and talents and living that reason. And the other conversation was with a young man uh, who contacted me on social media. And he asked me what I thought were the most important things that he should learn, not to just mm -hmm. be successful in, job, in his job or in business, but to mm -hmm. be successful in life. And I didn't want to give them that, you know, get up early, work hard, help out. Not that those aren't important. Those are incredibly important. Yeah. I wanted to see if I could go deeper with them. 
So I started taking some notes and eventually kind of had these 10 thoughts, these 10 ideas, these 10 principles. And so I sent them to him. And then I stepped back and I was like, well, I got a life story that fits underneath that principle. Or I know somebody whose life emulates this principle. So literally during the four to five months I was healing, after I had my leg amputated, I sat down at the computer and I built stories and they're real stories about real people underneath each of the principles. And that's how sustainable excellence came to be. Sustainable excellence. Where, where can people find it? Uh, anywhere you can get a book online, Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, Apple iBooks, wherever you can get your books online, you can find sustainable excellence. All right. That's great. Sustainable, uh, sustainable excellence with uh, uh, Terry Cook. <laughs> we just, <laughs> guys, go go ahead and find it. I think uh, we can just uh, talk more about books. However, uh, what I would like to also to talk about is uh, the blog. So is, does the blog also speak the same, uh, pretty much the same language as the book, or you, you, you tackle different topics on the blog? I, I tackle some different topics. On, on Mondays, I put out what I call the Monday morning motivational message. So I try to find a story or, or something that would kind of motivate people to kind of get, get the week off to a good start. Mm -hmm. And then on Tuesday, I publish uh, a sustainable excellence extra, which is sort of a takeoff on the book, something that's in the book. Same kind of thing. I, I look for a story. I remember somebody told me one time, never make a point without telling a story and never mm -hmm. tell a story without making a point. Wow. So I, I try to illustrate you know, if, if I told you five things, you might remember one of them. But if I told you five things and gave you a story about each of them, you would probably remember them better just because oh, we like stories, you know, <laughs> yeah. and that. So I always try to find stories to illustrate. I try to keep them short and things like that. But it's just I mean, it's something for me to do. I think everyone should have a writing practice. You should write a little bit every day. I mean, for me, a lot of times. It, it provides clarity to things. Like somebody will say, mm -hmm. you know, what do you think about this? And I don't really know what I think about it. I really haven't thought about it. It's nothing, you know, mm -hmm. that I've really contemplated. And so by, by sitting down and kind of writing things out, it provides clarity for me on different topics that I may not have an opinion on yet. Wow. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a, a journal. So you're journaling, but online. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is yeah another way to think of it. So it's it's really it's really great to see all these and yeah the thought process and pretty much everything that you do. And uh, for me, I'm just amazed to the fact that you you you're going through suffering and everything, but you're still there to motivate people. You're still there to to be at your best, like telling people uh, some of the realities that you found. Do you think there's any reason of uh, you being a uh, yeah? somebody who is hands-on faith helping you to really uh you know stay course we, we all everything that is happening I, I i absolutely think you know my faith is is incredibly important when i back in 2020 you know i had my leg amputated and found out i had these tumors in my lungs which i'm still being treated for and i remember my doctor showed me my my cat scan my ct scan and I have no medical background. I don't know how to read a CAT scan, but you can kind of look at it and be like, well, well that sure doesn't look like it belongs there. You know, I have, I have these mm. big tumors in my lungs. I have fluid all around the, the pleural spaces around my lungs. I was coughing up green, bloody phlegm. And I remember looking at my doctor and saying, how was I alive? And I will never forget this. He, he put his head down. He shook his head no. And then he looked up at me and he said, I don't know, because you shouldn't have been, you know, you shouldn't have been alive based on everything that you're seeing on that CAT scan, which said to me that God's not done with me yet. You know, when I die, where I die, how I die, way above my pay grade. I don't spend nearly any time worrying about dying. I spend more time focused on the living part of it because that's what I've got right now. Yeah, yeah. As they say, like he died so that we can live. Yes. So yeah, yes. we have eter that that life eternal. Although like uh, uh, many people may not understand it, but it kind of like fuels inside us and every single day. And yeah, I th I think that God is not done with you yet. You still have to write more books. We still have to get uh, a lot from you, uh, Terry. 
and I can say that uh, you still have so some so many things like uh, that you 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 have to uh, give to this world. You still have so many emptying to do. <laughs> you need to you need to empty yourself up. So uh, yeah. yeah, coming coming to the emptying of yourself up. So how do you uh, think that uh, you, you you is does that what you do play a role into uh, like your children and everything? Do you see the fruits of uh, everything that you're doing? uh in your children or also in how your 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 kind of like marriage and everything yeah i mean my my wife and i have been married for 31 years we have mm-hmm. one child a daughter uh who's a graduate of the united states air force academy uh mm-hmm. and is an officer in the new branch of the military the space force and the great thing you know about we you know there's just three of us so it's, it's not like i've got a really huge family or anything like that But we were all very close. I mean, we, we still are. We're very close with our daughter. You know, my wife and I, like I said, have been married for 31 years. And I would be dead many times over with this cancer journey if it hadn't been for my wife. So we are we're, we're great in that regard. But, our, you know, I look back at our daughter who in middle school was diagnosed with some learning disabilities. Mm-hmm. And then to be able to go to the Air Force Academy, to be able to be successful there, I'll tell you, one of the proudest days of my life was when she walked across the stage, got her diploma and shook hands with the president of the United States. Well, wow. I was like, you know what? I, I, I could die. I could have died right then and been like, you know what? I'm good. I'm good with that right now. So, yeah, I am. You know, my family is everything to me. And, and I'm very I'm just very blessed, very grateful for everything that I have with them. Wow, that this is really great and stuff. So like uh she she got into achieving more and uh doing all that and it makes you proud as a parent and anything. I think uh we most parents because now I'm parent but I'm not <laughs> like 30 years like you <laughs> married and stuff. So wow, 30 years. I- I'm going to ask you. <laughs> so I think for most parents is like uh Seeing your children succeed is one of the greatest achievements that you can do as parents. Like also doing things that uh, uh, can serve them in life. Yeah. And uh, as, as you say, it is like when you saw that and everything, it's like, okay, God, take me now. For, <laughs> so I, just, yeah. I think I've seen it all. <laughs> yep. Oh, man, that's really, that's really amazing. It hits home, really. Uh, because my, my son is, is just one right now. So one year old. And now doing a lot of stuff, trying to copy me, imitating me, everything that I'm doing is even doing like orders online if you just leave the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and what I want to see in him, uh, I'm sure as all parents, all, all the good things and everything. Uh, and I'm sure he's got like some tech, 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 uh, technology interests, but I, I would like to see where he's going to be because that is just emulating whenever he's growing up. Uh, from me but i'm sure he's gonna write his own story as you did right so like uh you you went to the police your daughter went to the air force uh you you you, your dad uh did uh business uh and administration you you went to to (laughs) to to serve as a police although you did that as a business and administration because that kind of helped you in your entrepreneurship journey so it's really that is uh it's really funny to see how things shape you know how reality shapes and everything that you encounter so are you also uh an advocate of uh uh the saying that your environment determines who you really become or people you surround yourself with determine who you really become in the future i i do i i mean i've been incredibly blessed to have the family that i did growing up to have the wife and the daughter that i have now absolutely I, that's one thing that I used to always tell my daughter, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're going to be a product of the five people you hang around with the most. So make sure those are smart people. Those are people that, that have initiative that want to do something with their life. And, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of times when, especially when I talk to younger people, I always give them kind of two pieces of advice. Number one, when you graduate, you don't have to have it all figured out. It, it's okay not to understand you know, where you're going and, and kind of work your way through it. But number two, I think it's more important. It's more important 
the people you work with and you work for than it is the work that you do. Find people that love you, that will invest in you, that you know want good things for you and climb the mountain with those people. Those that's how you become successful. You know, you don't do it in a vacuum. You know this. You're you're yeah. you're a successful business <laughs> person. You don't do this in a vacuum. That you need to have good people. So find that job that has good people. Don't find yeah. the job that's going to pay you the most money because if you don't know your worth, if you don't know your values, if you don't know what's important in your life, you will always default to wanting more money. And money yeah. usually is not something, I mean, it's important. Don't get me wrong. It's absolutely yeah. important. But in every human resources survey I've ever seen, compensation usually ranks, you know, sixth, seventh, or eighth on the list of importance. People want to be valued. They want to have their opinion matters. They want to be part of the team. All that kind of stuff comes before compensation. So, you know, I, I guess I would I would just tell you to get out there and and make mistakes, do things, you know, but not mistakes for the sake of mistakes, make mistakes for the sake of learning. Mm. I love the quote from Nelson Mandela, you know, the former president of South Africa, mm. who said, I never lose. I either learn or I win. And I, yeah. and I love that quote. You know, if you're going to lose, make sure you, you learn the lesson that you're supposed to learn from that loss. Wow. Learn from your mistakes, guys. I, I, I love that quote too. Oh, it's kind of a like coincidence. Yeah. I never, I never lose. Uh, I either, I either learn or win. Yeah. I, I do that. I do love that. I quote to so many people. That one. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. It's a great quote. Yeah, it is. We're like, I, I quote to so many people. Like I, I can't even imagine the amount of people I've quoted that to. <laughs> like, It's like, yeah, winner's mindset, winner's mentality and stuff. Like, it's really great. And also, when it comes to winning, as you said, it's not about yourself. It's like, yeah, you have everybody as is talented, everybody is skilled, but it's about uh, uh, what you put out. It's the value that you bring to, to, to the community. It's the value that you bring to the team. And uh, uh, working with other people, that's the best way. And business... It's not, yeah, it's not always about money. For most part, business is just relationship. Yes. Like, yeah. The better and great relationships you have, the more business you have. And that's really something that most people can take out from there too. So I uh, thank you again, Terry. Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, thank you so much again. So I, I was saying, like, I, I don't know uh, what you got after this, but this has been, great and uh uh we we think we can uh, we can even do more and we can talk for hours as i say uh because for me when i come to sit down with people who are pretty much resonate in so many things and have unique stuff because there's not uh much we can talk in like a 30 minutes or one hour or anything because it's pretty much like a live story right. you get it and uh what i can say is uh people should uh Guys, go look up Terry and learn more. Go read his uh, blog. Learn more of what he has and also uh, learn more of uh, who he is as a person first. And uh, if you, for anybody who has somebody with cancer or somebody struggling with cancer uh, and they are about to give up, I think uh, connect with Terry. You can get some, some advice about that and how, because personally, I don't know how he feels. But I'm sure you can help people. And also seeing you like being motivated and doing that, as, as I always say, it's, it's like wow to me. Like it's, it's really wow. And what I can say is like, it kind of like motivate me too. It's like every time I want to give up, I'm like, no, if Terry can do it, I can do it. Regardless of whatever reason it, it might be. But it's like, if Terry can do this, I can. Uh, so can I. So. Thank you so much, Terry. And uh, I'm sure that we're going to uh, talk more about this in the future episodes. And uh, if you have any questions or anything, just, uh, uh, you know, put in a comment for Terry and he's going to uh, answer and reply. Or you can reach out to Terry. His contact information are going to be put uh, in the description or anywhere this uh, is going to be posted so that you can reach out to him personally. All right. So Lois, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. 
<laughs> you're welcome terry you're welcome terry so one thing that before you go uh one thing that i wanted to tell you is like uh, um where can people find you uh, like uh as apart from getting the book and also uh reading the blog and where else can people find you and how can they contact you yeah i, I have a i have that, a blog sort of slash website it's called motivational check you can leave me a message there you can get access to the podcast I've been on. My social medias are all there. That's motivationalcheck.com. Wow, that's great. Motivationalcheck.com. Uh, connect with Terry. Uh, and uh, yeah, stay tuned for more. And Terry, thank you. 